On June 21, 2018, UBC Rocket's first supersonic rocket, Black Tusk, launched from Spaceport America, New Mexico. Launching as part of the Spaceport America Cup, Black Tusk was entered in the 30,000 foot commercial off the shelf category. Six seconds into flight, Black Tusk appeared to make a sharp left turn and broke apart. During the following days, recovery efforts were successful with debris being found over a three mile stretch. Over 90% of the external structure was able to be brought back to the base camp to be analyzed. The wreckage allows us an opportunity to learn from our mistakes and discover exactly what went wrong. This video has been made to document our findings and to sate curious minds who want to know exactly what causes a rocket to make a turn the way that Black Tusk did. Analyzing the footage, we see no hints of what is to come from Black Tusk's trajectory. The flight is remarkably straight and does not show any obvious signs of fin flutter prior to the event. Initially, Black Tusk's shred was reported to be due to fin failure, but that hypothesis does not match up with the footage. Zooming in very closely, it appears as though the top of Black Tusk folds over to the left and only then does it radically change direction. This implies that the failure originated further up the rocket than was previously thought. If this had been due to fin failure, we likely would have seen a fin falling off, followed by a change in direction, and then eventual disintegration. Instead, we see the opposite order. We were lucky enough to have multiple angles of the launch, and they help highlight the rather unique flight path that Black Tusk followed. This angle is from the spectator booth, and it does a really good job of illustrating how straight Black Tusk's flight was prior to its uh, 90 degree turn. That being said, the most interesting angle is definitely this one here, and we've slowed it down a little bit further to once again show that first, the initial failure is from above, where you can see the body tube tilt out and to the side, and then the rocket loses control. There were several shortcomings in Black Tusk's design that led to its failure, but for now let's focus on the nose cone and how it attached to the rest of the rocket. Black Tusk's nose cone was made of fiberglass with a metal tip, and it had an aluminum set ring in the bottom that bolted directly onto our payloads bay. This mounting solution is strong under axial loading, but it is not efficient at transferring any shear loading into the body tube. Analyzing the wreckage, we can see where this method of attachment failed, and the nose cone folded into the body tube. We see our nose cone here, which is still entirely intact. This is a fiberglass nose cone with a metal tip and an ABS 3D printed interior. This was attached via shock cord through our entire upper assembly, which held our payloads. The nose cone, which was once placed on the top, folded inwards, bringing the internal assembly with it. The internal assembly was made of these aluminum rails and these carbon fiber rods. The rails are quite bent, and we can see that the carbon rods are in multiple pieces. Looking at the rest of the upper body tube, we see a zipper down the entire side from the shock cord. We believe that the large hole here is from the payloads ejecting themselves from the rocket. The payloads had steel rails, and you can see that those are also quite bent. With that in mind, though, it's important to consider why the nose cone was subject to these forces that would cause it to fail. With that, we're going to move on to the analysis of the next segment, which is the external structure in the fuselage. Black Tusk was a tall rocket, especially compared to its 4-inch diameter. In fact, Black Tusk had an aspect ratio of over 30 to 1, which stands out as being exceptionally pencil-like in the world of rocketry. Its body tubes were made of only two layers of 12K carbon fiber. The upper coupler was made of the same material and had the same thickness, while the lower coupler was made of fiberglass to maintain a mandatory RF window as mandated by the competition. When selecting the thickness of the body tubes, axial loading and buckling were both considered. The tube was capable of taking 25 kN of force axially, which is a safety factor of 5. Buckling was also deemed to not be an issue. Physical three-point bending tests showed that Black Tusk would not fail under loading. That being said, we did not account for the fact that physical deformation would affect loading on other parts of the rocket, specifically from aerodynamic forces. We overlooked this key consideration and as a result did not spec out our parts with angular rotation in mind. The worst part about this type of loading is that it causes a feedback loop. As the tube gets bent more out of shape, there's an increase in loading transverse to the direction of travel of the rocket. The tube then bends out even more, causing even more loading until eventually the rocket fails. This lower coupler is about the midpoint of our rocket, and so it would have had the maximum moment to acting on it. 
but you can see that the coupler survived, but the body tube bent out at the bottom and eventually did fracture just above where the coupler was acting. Through some simple beam bending calculations and from the data from our testing, we can calculate that the nose cone would be out by 2 degrees if the rocket experienced 150 newtons of loading in a shear direction. Strong shear winds or even vibrations running through the tube could have easily caused this kind of deflection. From there, the nose cone would have been unable to withstand the shear loading because of its lack of a proper coupler and, well, you know the rest. For completion's sake, here's a brief overview of the state of the rest of the rocket. Moving on to our mid-assembly now. It has been fully deactivated and we've removed all of our CO2 cartridges and uh, our main release. It did not fire during the flight and that was due to the fact that the avionics bay got full on severed by the force and the wires were snapped before it even had a chance to deploy. We can see minor zippering at the top of the tusk on the middle body tube and we can also see some remnants of our parachute tube here which fit inside the middle tube and housed our parachute. We have the top of our lower body tube, and we can see that it experienced a similar failure mechanism to what we saw during our testing, just from axial loading. So this doesn't appear to be as much from flight as it does from landing. We can also notice that our coupler extends about six inches in to about there, so we're seeing it fail right at the edge of the fiberglass. So these are our two parachutes, our main and our drogue. And there are a couple of interesting things to note about them. The main did not deploy, but it is wrapped very tightly and it unraveled from the inside out. Just a little bit of an interesting situation. We can also see some carbon fiber stuck in it and some tears. This carbon fiber is from our main body tube, as evidenced by the paint job. In addition, we had it melt a little bit and we can see it's melted on our uh, cord here, <laughs> which has now grown pink. As for our drogue chute, it's fairly torn up in multiple locations. It had a real tough go. Here we have most of our fin can, mostly intact. We had two fins fall off and one remain attached. And we can actually see that it pulled off the top layer of the carbon on the inside. It's a very interesting failure mechanism. While the launch did not go exactly as we'd hoped, we had a lot of important lessons that we learned down at Spaceport America this year. As for the failures of Black Tusk, we were able to see that the fuselage was too thin and it had too few layers. As a result, the body tubes flexed more than they should have. This additional flex put more shear force on the nose cone, which was not designed to properly channel that into the rest of the rocket. As a result, Black Tusk went down. While fins were not the cause of failure, we will likely change our method of attachment going forward so that they may better withstand these types of situations should they ever occur again.